Hey, I'm Mike and welcome to Need It Make It. Is there a way to 3D print durable, flexible parts that are soft and cushy in some areas and firm and supportive in others, all within the same 3D print? Let's see what options we have and I'll explain why I think this is important and where I think this is gonna go in the future. So, stick around. I think we're pretty close to being able to send a 3D scan of our feet, our hands, really any body part in order to order a shoe or a helmet or even the glasses that fit us perfectly. At the moment, I don't know of a place that does this, but I think it makes a lot of sense to stop making generic and start making something that matches our shape perfectly. We have the faster printers, we have the higher precision, we have a lot more materials to choose from as well. So let's see if we can find a way to do all of these things by designing printing and testing out a fully 3D printed custom fitted piece that fits my rear end perfectly. I've wanted to make and test a 3D printed bike seat or a saddle for those cyclist snobs out there that perfectly fits the contours of my derriere. I have not found a saddle that fits me just right and the ride itself is painful enough without thinking about my butt the entire time. So I think it's time to see if we can bring this idea into reality. This is going to be a bit of a challenge and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get it perfect on the first go, but I'd like to give it a try. I already have several saddles, so I've decided to sacrifice the one that came with the bike in order to act as a base for us to build on top of. I need to tear off the pretty stuff and get down to the structure so that we can build it back up from something that's solid. Okay, it is clean and now I need to prep it for 3D scanning. I'm just gonna go ahead and paint this with some primer and a couple different colors just so the scan gets picked up properly. I'm getting set up to do my 3D scan and what I like to do is set it up with a white background. I find that the white works really well. I've tried some other colors. I haven't really had that much success with them. So I just keep on going back to the white background. On top of that, I have this white cylinder it's not perfectly white, but it seems to be white enough to do the job. And what I can do is prop this part up or any part that I want. And it allows me to rotate that really easily rather than having to try and work my way around with the camera. And that makes sure that I always have a white background or most of the time I have that white background in there. Now I probably should mention mine is not completely white, it has a few stains here and there. Apparently it doesn't matter but it probably is a little better just to have one that is completely white because the software will start to reference some of those colors and it might get a little bit confused. I haven't spent a ton of time on this. I think it's most important just to make sure that you prep your part with a little bit of color variation. It has no sheen or as little sheen as possible and some good lighting the white background, like I mentioned. Now, if you wanna know how to do 3D scans with your phone and have really good success, I already have some videos specifically on that subject. I'll link them up there at the top if you're interested in those. And it took a few minutes and this is what it gave me through Polycam. Now, some of the things that tend to go wrong with this, even though I have the LiDAR scanner on my iPhone and it works fairly well, is that the overall scale is not gonna be bang on accurate. So we will need to just run a couple measurements and confirm that it's okay. In my case, I needed to scale it down by about 1%. It was over by about two millimeters or so. Now we're kind of at a difficult point because I need to find a way to get the shape of my rear end onto here. And I don't think scanning my rear end is gonna be the solution. I'm not even sure that scanning my rear end is that easy. I think what I need to do is somehow put something on here and then sit on this. So I have it kind of rigged up, so I should be able to get on reasonably safely, sit in a position kind of like I'm riding the bike, and then hopefully that gives me the imprint that I'm looking for. So let me see if I can get set up to give that a try. I have a few ideas on some different materials to put on here. Maybe we'll have success on the first one. Maybe we will have success on none of them. Well, I just finished at the dollar store and I found these. Apparently these are beads and hopefully they'll do a good job of taking an impression. And I've got two packs of them, so that should be enough. We're back in the shop and I've got these ready to unpackage. Let's open this up and see if this is gonna work. Oh no. 
that said beads on the package. It says mix and twist. Well, okay. This might still work. <laughs> oh no. Okay, well it is holding the shape. It's gonna be hard to 3D scan that though. There we go. There's, th oh no. <laughs> no, it's not the beads I was expecting. <laughs> Sparkles. Uh, okay, it almost feels wet. It's, um, but it does hold the shape. Springs back just a little bit. All right, we've got problems. We've got problems. If you take a look, if I move this up, unfortunately, it is flowing out. So this is not able to keep the shape. I'm going to have to go to plan B. Luckily, this isn't a waste. This can just go to the kids. At least they can play with it. I've got a whole bunch of modeling clay that I'm going to try and use and I'm going to try and use the heat gun to warm it up a little bit just so it's a little bit more malleable, which I think should work really well and take a good impression. When I pictured doing this in my head, it was gonna be a lot easier and I was just gonna sit on the seat and it was gonna take the impression. That is not the case here, but I still think this is gonna work fairly well. What I'll do is warm up these areas especially and that way they can conform a little bit better. I'm gonna cover this up with some cling wrap. Glad cling wrap. Don't get bad, get glad. And I'm also gonna cover it up with some tin foil just to see if I can tell where most of the weight is coming down. So we have sit bone there and sit bone here. I'm gonna take those measurements as well, just so I have them for later. And a bit of compression in here as well. So this probably needs to be a little less firm and then very firm in this area. I think we're ready to move on to the next step, finally. I've marked all the areas that have had some compression to them, just so I can keep track of that for later on. I'm gonna do the exact same 3D scanning process for this one, and hopefully it turns out just as well or better than the last one. And now you can watch me really struggle to try and find a way to create a clean 3D model from that mesh in Fusion 360. And Fusion just is not very good with this type of thing. But I've also come to the realization that I just suck at modeling in this way. So I decided to switch over and try using Blender instead, which tends to be a lot more freeform and a lot better with meshes. And then after I'm finished in Blender, I can jump back into Fusion 360 and finish it off by subtracting one part from the other. And we should end up with something that is 3D printable. So we were able to get there in the end. I took the most recent scan and I subtracted the scan from that base plate. And then I ended up with something that was usable. Before we go any further with this model, we need to figure out how we're going to change the densities of some areas more than others, all within that same 3D print. We can take the model and quarantine areas of the model out, or we can use the intersection option. The model can look like this with parts that don't interfere, 
or it can look like this with parts that pass through one another. We can then make all the parts into components and export as a 3MF file so the position of those parts is preserved and they can remain grouped in the slicer if we want them to. Each of those parts can have their own properties set now. If we're using Orca Slicer, we can make those changes under the Object section. And while doing this, I didn't really expect this, but it turns out that in Orca Slicer, both the interference method and the non-interference method are treated the exact same way. There is no need to change any of the parts to a modifier. You just change the objects individually to the settings you want, and the slicer takes care of the rest. If we want to do this the extremely simple way, we can also just insert some objects and set those as modifiers and move them around as we need to, and that will allow us to do the same thing. As far as the infill selection, I like the idea of using gyroid because it has good airflow. It's also going to be pretty strong. But there is also this one that I don't see used very much, and it has some potential as well. It is called Adaptive Cubic. And in our case, I think it's going to create something that's too stiff, but what I like about it is that it resembles something similar to a bone structure. And what I think is pretty cool is that when one section of higher density will meet a section of lower density, where they mesh is much better at that intersection. Those areas both will have a higher density and compression in those areas will be more similar, and that should help to prevent one side from moving more than the other. So let's go ahead and get this printing. I'm using yellow high flow bamboo filament here. And even though it's high flow, I have better results when I'm printing it just above the recommended flow for the non high flow TPU. And here we have the final product. TPU really is an incredible material to work with. The layer adhesion is unmatched. Even the supports have bonded and need to be cut off to be able to separate them. Now I did remove this section that was kind of the intent in the first place and I was basing it off of some other seats where they don't put pressure on sensitive areas. So this was kind of my solution in order to get that and you can see how flexible it is in there. So what I need to do now is get this onto the base. So I need to take all of this stuff off. Well, I would say it's a pretty good fit. I'm going to try just using hot glue for now. I would like to be able to remove this. I don't want to have this permanently connected. Hopefully that does hold it well enough. So I've mounted it back onto the bike and it's hard to tell, but you can see there's a little impression here for the sit bone and one over here for the sit bone as well. These again are pretty hard. I don't know if that's gonna work. The rest of it is nice and supple, nice and flexible. So all that's left to do is saddle up and dry this thing out. Let's go. So I probably chose the worst day of the season to go for a bike ride. 
but that's not important. What's important is how did this thing actually perform? So I think probably the best way to gauge the saddles and the performance of the one that we 3D printed is to say how many times did I need to get out of the saddle or how painful was it during the ride? This one, even though it was custom fitted to me based on my sit bone positioning is incredibly painful. So it was probably a two out of five and I was constantly out of the saddle with this one. This one, which is supposed to be more comfortable, is I would say a two and a half out of five. I didn't need to get out as much, but by the end of the ride, everything was hurting quite a bit down there. Not particularly comfortable. So now we come to this one. How many times did I need to get out of the saddle? And were any of these good ideas at all? And it turns out I didn't need to get out of the saddle at all on this one. It was a little uncomfortable, I would say, just in this area on this side and on this side right in here. And I think that just comes down to my choice of the infill properties. I chose something that was a thicker line width, and I think I should have gone with something that is a smaller line width. This one is 0.3 millimeters, nice and cushiony. This one is 0.4 millimeters, still fairly cushiony, and this is 0.7, not much give at all. I think I ended up going with 0.7 on this one. It might have been 0.65. There's a little bit of give to it. So there is definitely some room for improvement on this, but I'm overall pretty happy with it. I'm not gonna change this right now. I'm gonna to continue to use it as it is. 3D printed bike saddles, shoes, and other gear are already available, but they are not custom fitted. They're still generic, and although they may be more comfortable, they're not going to match our bodies perfectly. In the example of the bike saddle, what I see is the best solution is to go to the shop, sit on a pressure sensitive device, Pick out the look that you'd like to see and then print the saddle that fits you perfectly with the support exactly where it needs to be. It's just like ordering a pizza with your favorite toppings on it and then after half an hour or an hour, it's done and we can go pick it up and start using it right away. This goes for shoes, for insoles, frames for glasses, really anything that contacts our bodies. Now in this video, I only showed a very basic version of what most people can do themselves, but this is only the beginning. In a couple weeks, I'm gonna be leveling this up to something truly amazing, and it's gonna be more flexible where it needs to be. It's gonna to be tougher. It's also going to look incredible too. So if you're curious where this is going and how to do it yourself, make sure you're subscribed and that you've hit that bell as well. Speaking of subscribers, we're now beyond 73,000 subscribers. So thank you for all the support and for the comments as well. It really helps to grow this channel and helps to make better content as well. Thank you to my patrons for supporting this channel and making these videos possible. And if you want to support this channel as well, there is a link down there below. Take care. I hope you enjoy the video and we will see you on the next one.